All right, so as the song says, uh, today we are starting the, the next unit, which is on uh, energy and momentum. So it's a, it's a different way of uh, looking at how things move. So with forces, you have to think, uh, and with kinematics, you have to know at every instant in time exactly what's going on um, with your object, right? So um, you have to be able to say, okay, here's the, the net force on the object. That's going to give me a certain acceleration. And then if that acceleration is constant, you can use kinematics to, to figure out where it's going to be, how fast it's going to be going at a certain time. Uh, but if you have something that's more complicated, things that vary, uh, you're going to have a tough time using forces. So uh, this demo by the end of the class will be able to, to examine. But if we think about, well, how would I do with, this, with forces with this? Now, the, this track, the one that uh, is basically a ramp, right? It's a straight line. We could deal with that, possibly. Um, but these other ones that are curved, you're going to have the, the net force on the object is varying throughout, or so the acceleration is going to vary throughout. Uh, so that's going to be a lot more complicated. But the nice thing about uh, energy and momentum is that it, it lets us ignore the, the details of, of the process and just go with, uh, we can look at uh, those quantities at the beginning of the object's motion and then compare it to the end. Uh, and skip all the messy in between, right? Uh, so the first thing uh, to get, so we're going to start with energy. Um, and the first thing that we're, we need to define is, uh, is work. Now, a little bit of uh, historical context here for uh, kinetic energy. So the, we're going to start out just talking about kinetic energy, the, the type of energy that an object has because it's moving. So this is... Uh, Emily du Chatelier, um, the, the quote here is, I, I love study with more fervor than I love the world. So she was a um, French woman in the late 1700s, early 1800s. I think I have the, okay, sorry, early 1700s to mid 1700s. Um, so sort of a contemporary of Newton and a little bit after. Um, and so, uh, when, when Newton was first publishing his laws of motion and uh, the law of universal gravitation, so he was English, right? Uh, but he would have published everything in Latin because that was just what you did back then to prove that you were smart, right? Uh, all sorts of, every kind of learned uh, writing, textbooks, all those sorts of things uh, were written in Latin because that was just kind of the language of the smart people. and. You know, to be fair, it was also an intentional barrier. Like, okay, well, now people can read English, but we don't want them to be able, you know, the, the masses, the, the, the regular people to be able to know all this fancy knowledge. We need to put another, you know, that, that extra level of barrier of writing things in Latin was there. So, um, <clears throat> there was another barrier to Newton's ideas making it to, to France, which was just that the French straight up didn't like the English. So uh, how could the physics that the English were doing be right? They're English, right? It's just this uh, you know, xenophobia or, um, well, the term didn't exist then, but jingoism, right? Everything that's French is better than everything that's from anywhere else. Um, so the French had Descartes, who had his own ideas about how physics worked. And they kind of fit more with Aristotle, which was kind of the tradition. Newton was breaking tradition. So it was hard to get the Newton's ideas to catch on. So one of the big things that, that Duchatelet, um, well, first of all, she, she was uh, a noble woman. So had, uh, had the best teachers to, to study math and physics uh, from the time that she was a child, because she didn't really have to work for anything. So she had time to do what she wanted. Women in those days were expected to, to study arts and, and music, uh, but she was more interested in, in math and um, philosophy, which would have included physics at the time. Um, so later, you know, she got married to somebody she didn't particularly like for reasons of nobility. You know, you have to marry the right kind of person. Uh, but being France, uh, 
you know, she also had an uh, affair with uh, Voltaire, who was a, the leading French philosopher at the time. Um, and so Voltaire started to get really into physics and Newton's ideas. He got exiled for a while during the, um, no, not during the French Revolution. That was later. Uh, but he got exiled for a while and spent that time in England where, where he was first exposed to, to Newton's ideas and brought those back. Um, and so uh, Du Chatelet uh, learned about this from, from, uh, from Voltaire and decided to translate this to French uh, so that that could help promote his ideas, which she thought were correct, over Descartes' ideas about how the, uh, the world works. Um, so her, so this is a copy of, a, of an old, uh, so it's the, the Movement of Bodies, first book. Okay, that's about all French I can read. Um, but she, uh, this is still the standard French translation of, of uh, Newton's Principia into, into French uh, today. Um, now, a difference between Voltaire, you know, Voltaire was really into these ideas, but he thought he could learn them without learning math, which is kind of crazy considering Newton had to invent calculus just to do physics. So, um, you know, he couldn't really keep up with the math, um, but Du Chatelet, uh, having had that math education, uh, was able to. So she not only translated the Principia, but she also extended Newton's work with, with uh, additional examples and experiments. So there was this, uh, well, and I, before I move on, uh, you know, this term also didn't exist at the time, toxic ma masculinity, but uh, really no other term for that, uh, that Voltaire basically ended his affair with her because he got mad that she had better, better ideas about physics than he did because she could do math and actually you know, uh, have reasonable ideas. Okay, so one of her uh, important ideas uh, related to this concept in Latin, the vis viva, which is sort of like the, the living force, right? So this is different from the debate at the time, or that continued later, that living creatures must have some special um, effervescence or something that distinguishes us from, from normal matter, and they're trying to figure out what that was, and my favorite weird thing was that they thought it was uric acid, so they thought like urine was like the reason why uh, we're different from rocks, but you know, whatever. But this is more about moving objects. What's the thing that makes them move and keeps them moving, right? Newton's first law says that if an object's in motion, it's gonna stay in motion, so what's, you know, what's the quantity uh, that's responsible for that? So Newton, you know, he was big on the, the concept of forces, and as we'll talk about later when we introduce momentum, uh, he really uh, related everything to momentum as well, forces uh, being a change in momentum. And momentum depends on the velocity of the object. So he was trying to do everything uh, using just velocity and forces and momentum. Um, but he had a mortal enemy, Leibniz, who was German. Um, and Leibniz also said that he uh, invented calculus, and so they had a long-standing beef over that. Uh, Newton said, no, I like published it in, I don't know, mirror reflective, reflected Latin first, and Leibniz was like, well, I published it where people could read it first, so, you know. Uh, we usually give credit to, to Newton, but we use Leibniz's notation when we learn calculus um, and his, more of his ideas. So he had this idea that we now call kinetic energy, which it was just something that depends on the velocity squared, right? So not just the velocity, but the velocity squared. Right now, both are also going to depend on the mass, right? So momentum is mass times velocity, and Leibniz said no, it should be mass times velocity squared. So how would you check? Well, um, there was a physicist or natural philosopher who, who did experiments, uh, Willem Gravzon. Um, so here's, a, here's an example of one of his apparatuses. So you can see you know, he had a, a ball that he would let fall through here, and then you could position these hoops, uh, and if the ball went through it, then you could use that to kind of track um, the, the motion and the trajectory of the ball, right? Because, uh, you know, back then the iPhone didn't have a slow-mo camera. So, um, you know, nowadays that's what I would do and try and trace that out with some kind of slow motion camera. Uh, but if you have an idea, or even just by trial and error, right, what else did you have to do? Um, roll balls down there and then see what path they take as you, uh, as you place these hoops and you 
can you can start to see that parabolic path that we're familiar with from uh, projectile motion. Now another experiment that he did was he uh, got this block of soft clay and found or uh, dropped brass balls, three identi or, you know, identical brass balls, so same mass every time, but with different velocities. Right, so uh, he found okay, drop this ball. Uh, with a certain velocity and it goes a certain depth d. If you double the velocity, it goes a certain and, and then it stops. Right? So if you double the velocity, it goes a certain depth four times d. And if you triple the velocity, it goes a depth nine times d. Right? So you can start to see this is one, one to one, two to four, three to nine. So we can start to see this dependence on v squared rather than v. So uh, that was the, the conclusion of Duchatelet, uh, was that the vis viva that, that we were looking for, what's unchanged about an object's motion, what's the quantity that's the same throughout, is kinetic energy. Um, or you know, the terminology was different at the time, but what we know is kinetic energy. So that was a big thing that, well, Newton's right, Descartes' wrong, but Newton didn't get everything. Right? There's more to physics than just forces. Right, which is why we're done with force, well, we're moving on from the main unit on forces even though we're you know, just over halfway through the semester. Um, so then the question, if, you, uh, if you're going to you know, launch the, uh, the ball off of, off of various ramps to get balls of different velocities, well, what height of the ramp would you need to, get each, you know, to achieve each velocity? So we need another concept on top of this to figure out, uh, you know, from your starting position, what velocity are you going to end with, uh, and to get that kinetic energy. Now, something that we don't really have the, the math to talk about, but Duchatelet, another uh, important thing is we'll see that kinetic energy um, so Leibniz basically said it should be mass times velocity squared but um, Duchatelet showed that there should be a factor of one half in front of that. So kinetic energy is one half mv squared, uh, and that, that factor of a half is essential. All right, so that's, I've, I've been sharing her story uh, for the past few years that I've been teaching uh, kinetic energy. It's not something that I, had learned up until like I don't know two or three years ago. So. Oh, forgot I had it in this. <laughs> okay, so the other concept that we need uh, to figure out how to relate, for instance, you know, if you roll a ball down a ramp, um, what's its kinetic energy going to be at the bottom? We need a concept which we call work. Okay, so work, W, uh, here's, here's a definition from our textbook. So um, it says, take the force, multiply it by D, the displacement that the object moves, and then cosine of theta. Right, so the force on the object, the displacement of the object, and then the angle between the force and the displacement. Right, so where that shows up in your picture is going to depend on which direction the object is moving. Now, same formula, but I like to, uh, I like to rearrange it a little bit um, because I think it helps connect better to uh, what we've been doing with forces and breaking them into their x and y components. And so I'm just going to group it this way. So, I'm putting the parentheses there just so that you know that the, you know, it's cosine of theta, right? But if we take f times the cosine of theta and then multiply that times displacement, okay, right? But multiplication, it doesn't matter what order you multiply things. But if I say, well, this whole thing in parentheses then, I'm taking a component of the force, right? So it's not the overall magnitude of the force that matters. It's only the part of it that points in the direction that the object moves. Right, uh, and that's the uh, displacement of the object. 
right? So uh, same formula, just grouped differently. And so I think that if we uh, look at an example, uh, of a dude wearing very clean white dress shoes to mow the lawn for some reason. Um, we have a lawnmower moving to the right. So the displacement is a vector, right? It has a, it has a magnitude and direction. That's pointing to the right. Uh, but the force is directed along the, the handle, right? Which is down and to the right. So, okay, we can use our usual x, y coordinates, right? We can break that force into x and y components. <clears throat> so if we're going to calculate the work done by that force, which component uh, are we going to use? So you can go ahead and get your uh, phones or computers out to, to do the poll. All right, so same picture there. The force is, is as shown. The lawnmower moves to the right. Which component of the pushing force is used to calculate the work? Is it horizontal? component, the vertical component, is it the entire magnitude, or does this force do zero work? Oh, you know, this is, I just introduced this uh, um, equation to you, so we're trying to make sense of that. So I'm um, happy to see the most, uh, the most common answer was that it's the horizontal component of the, um, the force that does the work. So if I look at the angle that's in this picture, theta, uh, it's the angle between the force and the displacement. So if I were to do uh, F times cosine of theta, it's going to give me the horizontal component. Uh, but I think it's easier to just say, well, which part of the force, you know, try and identify which component is actually doing something, right? If you think about What's the other component of, of the force doing? Well, you're pushing down on the lawnmower, but it's on the ground. It's not moving that way, right? So because it doesn't move that way, that component, you know, you're kind of wasting your effort, right? If you were, you know, if the lawnmower is really heavy and you're not able to, to push it along the uh, handle like that, what would you do? You'd try and, you know, squat down and try and make your force more horizontal, right? So that more of your force you know, a greater component of your force is actually being useful. So, you know, I, I, I don't try and use, uh, I don't know, words of judgment, like good, bad with physics, but like with work, it kind of works out. You know, uh, there's a component of the force that's actually doing something useful. It's moving the lawnmower. Uh, and the other one is, is doing nothing. All right, so now that's not, uh, okay, so it's only the horizontal component that, that matters. Uh, and so that, as I said, is, is f cosine theta. Right, so we would multiply the x component of the force times the displacement, and this is rearranged because uh, you know, I got this the diagram from the textbook. So again, it doesn't matter which order you multiply those things together. Now what about uh, other forces in this picture, right? If we drew the free body diagram for this lawnmower, it wouldn't just be the, the person's pushing force on it, there would also be uh, a normal force and the gravitational force. Oops, I thought I had a pole on this, but that's fine. Um, so the normal force points up, right? So what's the horizontal component of the normal force? Is there one? No. All right, so the normal force points up. That means that no matter how the lawnmower is moving, well, as long as it's not jumping off the ground, which it's not. Uh, but you know, if it's moving horizontally, the normal force is not going to do any work. Same thing with the force of gravity. In this, in this case, because the, um, the lawnmower is not moving vertically, uh, gravity does no work. Work can also be positive or negative. Right? So work does not have a direction. It's a scalar quantity, uh, meaning it's not a vector. Um, <clears throat> but it can be either positive or negative depending on whether the... Um, force points in the same direction as the displacement or not. So here we have a gif of SpongeBob raising a barbell, right? Um, so if we look at just the part while he is raising the barbell, so, uh, well, I guess I should give you the, the definitions, right? So if, if the force and the uh, displacement are in the same direction, then the work done is positive. And if they're in opposite directions, the work done is negative. So again, you can kind of use that moral judgment, right? 
are you helping the object move or are you preventing it from or trying to prevent it from moving, right? Are you working against it? So, okay. Uh, made this into a poll. Also, so during the during just the raising motion, as SpongeBob raises the barbell, the work he does is positive, negative, or zero. The most common answer is positive, right? So if we think about if he's raising the barbell, he's got some pushing force, right? So he pushes the barbell up, and the barbell moves up. Right, so those are in the same direction, so the work done is positive. All right, uh, how about, oh, okay, yeah, so um, the, the work done is positive, so um, this is known as concentric training, so, well, I don't know sponge anatomy that well to say what, what kind of muscles he necessarily is using, but, you know, Let's say, let's assume he's got arms, so he's got triceps, right? So at least for some part of this, uh, he's shortening his triceps and doing work with the triceps, right? The, the triceps are, are providing this force. Uh, so this is known as concentric training. Uh, so this is probably the most, uh, you know, when uh, people without a lot of knowledge about training, when you think about weightlifting or training, this is, this is what you think about, right? Moving an object. Uh, with positive work. Okay, so now let's uh, stick with the undersea theme. We've got Mr. Krabs, and he is lowering the barbell. Right, so as he lowers the barbell, is the work that he does positive, negative, or zero? Okay, so the, so the answer here is, uh, is that he's doing negative work. Right, so as you lower the barbell, uh, you've got to keep it from crushing you, right? So you're still pushing upward uh, on the barbell even though it's lowering, right? You're just not pushing hard enough to, to hold it in place, right? So, um, you know, with any kind of repetitive weight training, you have to do both uh, concentric and eccentric training or motions, uh, but depending on, you know, there's certain times that you can focus more on one or the other. So, for instance, like if you're um, trying to, to learn to do a pull-up, right, and you can't do a pull-up yet, you might just, uh, you know, do what are called negatives. You, you go up to the bar and then try and lower yourself as much as possible, or as slow as possible, um, but you're not strong enough yet to, to pull up, right? So you're still working the same muscles, just in the, in the opposite direction. And so, uh, you know, in that case, just to keep it simple, thinking about the arm muscle, right, uh, on a on a pull-up, you'd be um, shortening the biceps on the way down. You're lengthening the bicep. All right, uh, so here we got one more example. Of course, SpongeBob's barbells are more interesting. So uh, as he holds the barbell, right, so he kind of gets this triumphant pose and, well, briefly triumphant, uh, is holding it above his head. All right, so as he holds it, the barbell's not moving. So is his work going to be oops, positive, negative, or zero? So he's got a force that's still pointed upward, uh, but the displacement of the barbell during this part is zero. Right? So whatever that force is, whatever direction it points, if the displacement is zero, the work done is zero. Right? Because zero times anything is zero. Right? So uh, this is another type of uh, training that, that you might do uh, where the, the target muscles, uh, so in that case, you know, triceps, some other muscles, um, would be staying the same, same length, and so this is known as isometric training. Right? So this shows us that when you're talking about you know, uh, weightlifting or other kinds of training, right, both of the first two, there was some work being done. In this case, there's no work being done, but you know that you can't just infinitely uh, hold a barbell above your head, even if it's just drink cups, right? You wouldn't be able to hold your arms over your head infinitely. So there's more than just work involved, um, but there's also more than just forces involved, right? So especially if you're trying to think about, you know, maybe not with weightlifting, but with other sorts of uh, exercises, you might be work, uh, trying to burn a certain number of calories. Okay, so 
why do we care about the amount of work done by a force? Um, well, the reason why is that work and kinetic energy are, are related to each other. So if you have a force that does work on an object, the kinetic energy of that object is going to change. Right? And we, we I mean, if, you, if, I, you know, if I give you the definition of kinetic energy, right, that it depends on velocity, well, we know that if you have an unbalanced force on an object, it's going to accelerate, which means the velocity is going to change. Right? So this is a different way of saying things that we already know. But as I mentioned before, it might be a simpler way to, to solve certain problems. Right? So if we can calculate the work, uh, then we can uh, calculate the change in kinetic energy on the object. So again, there's a definition of kinetic energy at a given, for a given block. Excuse me, velocity. Hey, so if I, uh, so this is, um, you know, we got a fancy term for this. It's the work kinetic energy theorem, right? So um, work is equal to the change in kinetic energy. So if I say, you know, my starting velocity is v naught, my final velocity is v, right, using the same um, sort of uh, variables that we've used before, then if I calculate the work, then I can uh, say, well. Um, my final kinetic energy minus my initial kinetic energy is going to be equal to that work. Right, so when you're using this, you're usually going to say, well, what does the, uh, what is, you know, calculate what is the work from the definition of work, and then you're going to calculate what the work does, right? The work changes the energy of an object. In this case, so far, all we're, all we're talking about is kinetic energy. All right, so if we go back to the to the ball clay experiment, uh, why does the why does the or why does the uh, depth of penetration uh, depend on the velocity squared? Well, we can think well this soft clay block is doing some work on the on the ball, right? So um, the amount of work that it has to do, well, well, we can assume that the force that it can provide is is the same. Right, so it has to do some negative work on the ball. Right, the ball has some kinetic energy, and we want to bring it to a stop. Right, so if you're slowing an object down, the work done always has to be negative. Right, so we're trying to stop this ball. Right, so it, it takes a certain amount of work. Right, and because the force is always the same, if we want the clay to do more work, the distance just has to get bigger. Right, so here we have double the velocity, and therefore four times. Uh, the kinetic energy. So the clay has to do four times as much work, so the, the ball goes four times as deep. And then we go to the, the third ball, which has three times the velocity and therefore nine times the kinetic energy, and so the clay has to do uh, nine times the work, and therefore it goes nine times as far. So this is a problem that's, that's similar to this demo apparatus that I have set up. Right, this greased pig has three different slides that it has the option of sliding down. Right? So A is, pre is the steepest, B is kind of in between, C is the least steep. Right, so if we just want to say, well, what's the greatest velocity when the pig gets to the ground? And ignore friction, right? that's why it's a greased pig. Um, then uh, which slide would the, would, the sli would the pig slide down? And note for the, for the pig on the slide and for the balls rolling down the ramps that the starting height and the ending height is the same for all. I think I have a slide that'll show the results. I'm with the screen recording. I can't see my preview slide, so there we go. All right, so we have a dispute. All right, so probably the the most common. Uh, okay, well, that's probably fifty is the biggest number up here. 
So I can say with 100% certainty that that's the biggest number. So most people said that the steepest slide will make you go the fastest at the bottom uh, if, if there's no friction. want to uh, rewrite that work definition one more time. All right, so if we say, well, work is equal to force times displacement cosine theta, if I put the parentheses around d cosine theta, what that tells me is that if the force is the same, right, because the force of gravity is the same for all these slides, but the angle between them is, is different. But what really matters is the distance that you go in the direction that the force points. Right? So gravity points down. So in this case, this is just going to be the height. Right? They all go the same distance in the vertical direction, which is the only direction that gravity has any effect on. Right? So for the pig on the slide, you would say, well, yeah, one goes farther horizontally, but that doesn't matter for gravity. It's going to be able to do the same amount of work because the change in height is the same throughout, and the force of gravity is, is, is the same throughout. Right. So, um, so that's the, the mathematical explanation for why that demo works the way that it does. OK, so uh, that's, that's all for today. So, um, I will see you Friday. All the same. Yeah, all the same. Sorry, yeah, there's the check mark.